Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial and playthrough for Cloudspire. In this video, I'll be showing you how to play the game while we're actually playing it, and if you'd like to watch the rest of the playthrough, you can find a link for that down below in the description or by clicking the I up there in the top corner. Now before we move on, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. That way, if I make any mistakes while we are playing, I can then put corrections directly on the screen and you should be able to see them. Now what's going on in Cloudspire is each player is in charge of an asymmetric faction, and your goal is to try and to destroy the opposing fortress. Now you will do this by recruiting minions and heroes that will march across the map and try to defeat the opposing units as well as neutral landmark minions. Now all throughout the game you will be gathering source as a resource, and you can spend that to upgrade your fortress, which gives you uh, lots of new abilities. You can also construct and upgrade your spires, which will help you destroy your enemies out there on the field. Now there is a lot going on in this game, and I will explain how each of these works as we bump into them while we play. Now before we jump in, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with pretty cool bonuses like voting on a couple of the videos that I film each month. Alright, let's now jump into the game. Out here, the game is fully set up and ready to play for our two different players. Now today, we will be playing as the giant Bronin faction, and our opponent is in charge of the Grove Tenders. Now we are going to be the starting player for this game, so let's go ahead and begin playing. Now the structure of this game is we are going to play up to four total rounds. Now we might play less if either one of us has our fortress health reduced to zero. We both start with a health of 10, and we are obviously trying to send our units over to destroy the opponent's fortress. Now within each one of the rounds, there are six total phases, and the first one is an event phase. Now you do not do this phase in the starting round of the game, so I'll explain how that works once we start the second round of the game. This means we can now go into the second phase, which is income. The way this works is each player will simultaneously gain an amount of source that varies depending on the wave. Now we can see in the first wave, which is also the first round of the game, we will each gain five source. So that means we can look down to our tracker and spin this over until the 5 meets the indicator. While we increased our source, we can see that our opponent did as well. Now before we move on, I do want to point out that this tracker maxes out at 20. So if you would take more source than would be allowed over here, you just lose the excess. Now there are ways to actually have this flip over and go to a maximum of 30, but I'll explain how that works when we get to it. With income down, we can now move into the third phase of the round, which is the market phase. Now the way this works is each player can, in turn order, do one market action. Now with that action, they can either purchase one of these face-up market tiles or the top Earthscape mat. So we have the option of purchasing first, and if we want to take this Earthscape mat, that is going to always cost two source. Now instead of taking this, we could purchase one of these, and they have a variable source cost. So let's focus in a little more, and you can see the source cost is listed in the right-hand side with that orange symbol. So that means Londil, which is a mercenary hero, would cost us four of our five source. This brick and mortars uh, mercenary spire would cost us four, and this mini harvester would cost us two. Now this mini harvester is actually a piece of equipment that we could put underneath one of our heroes if we wanted to, and that would give them the reap ability. Now I'll explain the details of this once it becomes relevant. Well, I like the idea of this mini harvester. So we are going to spend two source, and then we can equip this on a hero later on in this wave. So let's add this right over here, and of course spend our two source. And now our opponent has the option of doing one market action. Now they've decided they're going to pass on this to save up their source, which means it's now time to move on to the fourth phase of the round, which is the build phase. Now the way this works is beginning with the starting player, each player can do one build action and then pass to the next player, and you'll keep going back and forth until each person passes. Now there are four different things that we can do as an action in the build phase, and the first of these is constructing one of our spires. Now each faction has four total spires to choose from, but at the start of the game we only have access to the dispatch platform and this drilling outpost. Now they have a source cost listed on them. We can see the dispatch platform costs four source and the drilling outpost costs three. Currently we do have three source, so we could use this to build out this drilling outpost if we wanted to. Now I don't think this is going to be our action, but let's just pretend it would be just so you know how this works. Now whenever you play a spire down, it has to go on top of a source well. Now at the start of the game, each player has two source wells within their fortress, and then out on the map every one of the other source wells is covered up by a landmark tile. 
Now you cannot put a spire down onto any of these spots until the landmarks are removed. This means at the start of the game, the only two places we can put this are here and here. Now let's just pretend that this landmark was gone and this was available. Now whenever you build out your spires, you can put them into a hex area that is in your influence. Now one of these is in your influence if it is adjacent to your fortress gate, and as you can see this one is, and by hex area I mean this large uh, mat right here. Now, an area is also in your influence if it is adjacent to a hex area that has one of your spires. So that means at the start of the game, each player has influence only in the area right in front of their fortress. But if we were to build this spire here, then going into the future, we now have influence on all three of these hex areas as well. Now, whenever you build a spire, you immediately put the listed upgrades underneath it. We can see this drilling outpost would put one of these fortification upgrades underneath, and then this dispatch platform right here would take one of the attack upgrades and one of the range upgrades, and they would then stack that underneath. Now you can put them down in any order of your choosing, and that order will matter, but I'll explain how that works later on. So let's just pretend like we built this dispatch platform. Obviously we cannot afford it, and this now leads us to the second action we can do as a build action. Now this is upgrading one of your spires, and the way you do this is you can buy a new upgrade token to put underneath it. Now we can see that this one already has the two upgrades that it starts with, and listed right over here on the bottom, there are these little blue dots. Now that tells you how many upgrades that, that tower can take, so this dispatch platform can take one more. Now whenever you buy a range or attack upgrade, you have to spend an amount of source equal to the number of upgrades that spire has once that upgrade gets slid underneath. So that means the third upgrade costs three source and the fourth upgrade would cost four source. Now that's the case for these two, but if you ever want to buy a fortification upgrade, that just always costs two of your source. So that is two out of the four build options, and the third one involves placing out an earthscape mat that you were able to purchase from the market earlier on. Now whenever you place these out, you have to make it so that at least one of the three zones is in an area of your influence. So that means we could hypothetically put this down just like that, because at the start of the game we only have influence on this hex group, and that is within our hex group. Now you are allowed to actually place these down so that they are not on top of previous mats. You can actually put them over to the side. Now you can only do this if it is touching a hex group that has one of your spires on it. So that means at this point in the game, this is not a legal placement. Speaking of illegal placements, you are also not allowed to place this so that some of it is on a different level than the others, and the most important restriction is you are not allowed to place this in such a way that would break up a path from your fortress over to your opponents. Now you may have noticed there is a variety of different terrain types, and the predominant one in this game is path. Now you can see that is going right over here, so if this was placed in such a way to break that path, for instance if it went right over here, then we would no longer have a path to our opponent's fortress, and that move would be illegal. Now if we wanted to, we could do something like this, and that does break up this path here, but we still have a legal path going around there to get over to the opponent's fortress. We've now come to the fourth and final build action option, and that involves upgrading our fortress. Now you may have noticed that there are some holes in here for dice. At the start of the game, as the Brawnen, we actually have a Forsaken die that's right over here, and the value that shows does not actually matter. Next up, you'll notice there are a variety of spots with 1, 2, and 3 numbers on them, and there are holes next to them that can be fit with these pegs. Now whenever we buy one of these upgrades, we have to spend the source associated with it, and we will then get a permanent upgrade for the rest of the game. With that in mind, we can now look to the Brawnen player aid, and this describes the source cost as well as the effects of every one of the upgrades in our fortress. Now you always have to start with the first upgrade and then work your way down, and I think we finally bumped into what our build action is going to be. Let's go ahead and upgrade our source drill to drilling refinements. When we focus in a little bit, you can see the first level is going to cost us 3 source, and it says once we have drilling refinements, we gain plus 3 source during each income phase for the rest of the game. Remember, the income phase gave us 5 source in this first wave, so that means next round we will get 3 more. Now we have to spend 3 source to make this happen, so we are essentially investing it into having a butter source engine in the later stages of the game. We can now spend our 3 source, which means we are out of source, and then we can take this indicator and put it in the appropriate spot in our fortress. Well, that's finished out our action, so now our opponent can go. In this case, it looks like they want to upgrade their inner oak. 
Now the first level says amplify and they will gain plus four source during each one of the income phases and their source capacity is now increased up to 30. So they can add this right over here and then spend the three source which brings them down to two. Now as I said this now means they could flip this over and go up to 30 source total if they end up gathering that much. With their build action done, play has come back to us, and if we wanted to, we could build a spire, upgrade a spire, place an earthscape if we had one, or upgrade our uh, fortress again. But at this point, we are out of source, so I think we are going to pass. That means it's going to go back over to our opponent, and they do have two source left over, but it looks like they want to save that, so they are going to pass as well. So let's now go into the fifth phase, which is the preparation phase. Now the way this works is each player is going to get a number of command points depending on the wave. If we come back to the rules, you can see in wave 1, we will get 5 command points. In wave 2, that goes to 7, then 9, and 11 if we make it all the way to wave 4. Now, these command points are used to deploy our units. Now, when we take a closer look, you'll notice on the right-hand side, there is a yellow icon with a fist. Now, that is the number of command points that you have to use to deploy that unit. Now, in the first wave of the game, we are only allowed to deploy Osh, our hero, and fortunately, they have a deployment cost of 0. Now, we are only ever allowed to have two heroes in play at any moment, and that means in the future we could potentially get Drang or even Cram the Mighty out, but of course Cram has a humongous command point cost. So Osh will certainly be one of the units that we deploy. So we can look to the other units that we have, and we know that we have five command points available. Now we can see the Battleborn only costs two command points, and this dispatch here costs three. Now the Architect over there costs 4, and in fact all of the rest of these cost even more than that. Now I don't think we want to do that for this first turn, because we would not have a good way to spend the one remaining command point. So let's go ahead and bring out a Dispatch and a Battleborn, which will cost 3 plus 2, or 5, which is the total amount of command points we have for this wave. Now that we have selected these units, it's now time to collect a Deployment Stack. Now, as you can see, we have one hero and a couple of units, and you are never allowed to put a hero between your other units. So that means heroes have to either go before or after all of these other units. Now, the ordering in which we put these in our stack will be the order in which these units will march out across the field. Now, I do think we want to start with Osh here, and you can see on this token that Osh has three health. Now what this means is we have to take three of these health tokens and stack them underneath Osh, and that is going to be at the top of our deployment stack. After this, we have to decide what the next tile will be underneath Osh. Now we can see the Battleborn and Dispatch both have three health, so that means one of the options we could do is to take three health for each of them. We would then put these underneath, and we could potentially stack this one like that and like that. This right here would be a deployment stack, but we have another option instead. Now you are allowed to group up your units. Now you can see right here that each one of these has a movement value, which is shown by the green number. Now it looks like all of the units for this wave have a movement of 2. So we could group these two units together, and when you do that, you do not put the health for the top unit between the two. Instead, you put the health for the top unit underneath them. So right now we have grouped this Battleborn underneath the Dispatch. Now it's worth noting, you always have to make sure that the faster of the units is underneath the grouping. So we can see they both have a movement of 2, so this is fine. Now what this means is these are going to move as a group, and once the dispatch is destroyed, then the Battleborn will essentially pop out, and then it will keep marching towards our opponent's fortress. Well, in this case, I think let's not bother with grouping. So we can put these right here, and then put Osh on top, and we have now finished out our preparation phase. Now this happens simultaneously with all of our opponents. We are allowed to ask them what units they are planning on using, but we are not allowed to know how they are actually stacking up these units. So right now our opponent only knows that we have one Battleborn and one Dispatch. They can also see we have a hero on top, so they just have to guess at which one is which down here. So we can look up here, and our opponent has now built out their deployment stack. The hero that they are allowed to use in Wave 1 is Dwen right here. Now they have told us that they have a Warbriar as well as a Taproot down here somewhere, and that has finished out the deployment phase. At this point, we've reached the sixth and final phase of this wave, and that is called the Onslaught phase. So we can start over here with us, and every turn in the Onslaught phase goes through five steps. Once we finish those steps, then our opponent will go, and then we will get to take another turn, and we are going to keep doing this over and over again until either one of us has a gate destroyed, or until either one of us has all of our minions killed out on the map. Now this does not count to the heroes, and I'll explain that in more detail once we start seeing some combat. 
So let's begin with the first step on an onslaught turn, where we perform any start of turn actions. Now this might be talents, events, or relics that would trigger, but at this point I don't think we have any of those. Now there's one more thing we could do in this start of turn step, and that involves a limited build action. Now you may have noticed at the bottom of our fortress there are these two peg holes. Now when you do a limited build action, you put a peg into one of these, and once both of these are full, you cannot do any more limited build actions for the rest of this phase. Now in a limited build action, you are simply allowed to build a spire or upgrade a spire in the same way we were able to do this in the building phase. Well, we currently have a zero source, so we are obviously not going to do a limited build, but we might get more source as we defeat our opponent's units, so it's possible we might actually construct a spire before this wave is over. We can now move on to the second step of our turn, which is unit movement. Now, the way this works is we find the unit that is closest to our opponent's fortress, and it will move up to its full movement value. Now, after we do the closest, we do the second closest and third closest until we have moved every single one of our units. Now, at the start of this uh, turn, we have all of our units in a deployment stack, so that means we are simply going to move the unit that is on top of that stack. Now, that is Osh here, and they have a movement of two. Now, normally, when units move, they are simply going to go down this path a number of movements that are listed on the token. However, in this case, our top unit is a hero. Now, heroes have some more control. We can actually send them in any direction that we want. We do not have to send them straight over towards the fortress. Now, you may have noticed there is a little forest symbol on Osh. Now, that means they have the ability to walk through forests. Now, there are five different types of terrain in the game, and each one of them has a different difficulty to overcome. Now, the easiest terrain to walk on is path, and every unit in the game can walk on the path. The next easiest is plains, the third easiest is forest, the fourth easiest is mountains, and finally, water is the hardest terrain to go through. Now you can see over here that Osh has the forest movement, and whenever you have the ability to move through a specific type of terrain, you are also allowed to move through all of the easier terrain. So that means Osh can move through forests, plains, and paths. So let's move Osh, and I think let's just send them right over here to this forest section. As you can see, they can move up to two spaces, but with heroes, you can optionally choose not to move the full amount. Now after we have moved Osh, it's now time to move our dispatch. Now, it does not have any special terrain walking abilities, so it can only go on path, and we can see it has a movement of two. So that means it is going to head two spaces down the path towards our opponent's fortress. And lastly, we have the Battleborn. Now, they have a movement of two as well, so they're going to move right over here, and you'll notice they cannot go their full movement because there is another minion in the way. So we finished the movement step, so we can now go into the third step, which is Spire's Firing. Now at this point, any opposing Spire that had any of our units within its range would fire on our units. Fortunately, that is not currently the case, so we can move on to the fourth step, which is Exploration. Now the way this works is we can explore every landmark tile that is currently adjacent to one of our minions. Now I figure let's start with this one right here, and when you explore, you get to peek at the back without showing it to your opponent. In this case, we have found a gate port, and it has two talents listed on it. The first one says Riftwalk, and the second one says Overload. Now, in order to know what these do, we have to consult the landmark talent table. Here it is, and we can look down here and see that for Riftwalk, this says that we treat this spot as if it was a path hex. Now, this effectively would let us teleport to any other one of these tokens that also says Riftwalk out on the board. Currently, there aren't any of them, and it has another talent which says Overload. Now this means if we wanted to, we could spend 6 of our source to immediately remove this from the board, and as a benefit, we would get this bonus right here. As you can see, the game comes with a bunch of relics, and they do a wide variety of things, and we'll talk about these once we actually start seeing them. So this has been explored, but if we want to, we can leave this face down so that our opponent does not know what this is. Now I think that's probably a good idea considering this is a teleportation ability so close to our fortress, so let's leave this right over here and now we can explore this tile. So in this case we can flip it over and this is a Traxar loner. Now we can see that this is uh, different from the one we saw before, this is actually a unit. Now it has 4 health, it attacks for 1 damage, it potentially could move up to twice, and it has a talent called Engage. Now, engage means we have to actually explore this. If you ever see engage, you do not have the ability to put this face down. So what this means is we have to find four health chips, and we can then stack these underneath the Traxar loner, and this is now something that we can fight. 
Now that is good because over here it says as a reward for defeating this Traxar loner, we would get four source, and we could use that to do a limited construction to get a spire out on the board. Well, we've reached the fifth and final step of our onslaught turn, which involves attacking. Now, in this step, we will have every one of our units attack. Every minion must attack, and the heroes can optionally attack if we want to. Now, we can perform these attacks in any order of our choice. So, it will take away one of the health tokens from the Traxar loner, and whenever a unit is attacked and not defeated, it will retaliate back. Now the retaliation will do damage equal to the attack value of that unit, so in this case that's 1, and this will only happen if the retaliating unit has range on the attacker. So unfortunately we would love Dispatch to be right over here, which means it would not be retaliated, but that's not how this worked out. So that means Dispatch is going to take 1 damage from the retaliation. And the next thing I think we should do is activate Battleborn. Now this has an attack of 1, and it does not have any range, but again the Traxar loner is adjacent. So it is going to do 1 damage to the Traxar loner, and then it will retaliate back, doing 1 damage to the Battleborn. At this point, Osh is the only unit that has not attacked, and it has an attack of 1. Now you'll notice Osh also has a talent called Hunter. Now this says that Osh will always do plus 1 damage whenever they fight a landmark unit. This means Osh is going to do 1 plus 1 or 2 damage, and the Traxar loner currently has 2 health. So that means both of these will be removed, and since the Traxar was just defeated, it will not retaliate back at Osh. So we can now take this as a reward and get 4 source. It looks like we were at 0, so now we go up to 4. At this point, there's one more thing to do with the defeat of that Traxar loner, and that involves leveling up our hero. Now, whenever a hero defeats a unit, a spire, or one of the opposing gates, they will immediately level up. Now, whenever a hero levels up, we have to check to see how many upgrade tokens they have underneath them. Again, these are the upgrade tokens available. Now, we can see that Osh has an upgrade capacity of 1, and they currently have 0 upgrades, and that means we can now take 1 upgrade and put it underneath. Now, it's worth noting you are not allowed to increase the range of a unit unless they have at least some range talent already. So, Osh is a melee fighter, and we cannot increase their range. Now, this means we can add either an attack upgrade or a fortification upgrade. If we added this fortification, then that would essentially be one more health that Osh has before they die. Now, in this case, I think let's do some more damage. So, let's slide this attack upgrade underneath. So, Osh now has one upgrade, which means they are at capacity, and that means if they level up again by defeating a unit, a spire, or an opposing gate, then they will actually flip over, and their attributes get better, they actually gain a survival talent, but whenever you flip over to the promoted side a hero, you remove any of the upgrades that they currently had. Alright, we finished out our first turn of the Onslaught phase, which means our opponent can go which means they begin with any start of turn activations, and they could do a limited build if they want to, but they are going to pass on that. This means they can start movement, and we can see here that Dwin has the forest walk ability, and Dwin also has two movement. Now in this case, they are simply going to move twice down the path. Next up, they have a Warbriar. Now this does not have any terrain movement abilities, and it has two movement, so it's going to move once right over here, but at this point, the Warbriar has not used all of its movement. So let's focus over here, because every time you have a hero blocking the full movement of a friendly minion, then that friendly minion and that hero are going to swap places. Now these minions always want to move their full movement towards the opposing fortress, and in this case that means Dwin and the Warbriar will trade places. Lastly, they have a taproot, and it has a movement of 2. So in this case, it wants to move towards the fortress, and they have a friendly hero in the way, so they are once again going to trade places, which means they effectively could have put Dwin at the bottom of their deployment stack if they wanted to. Now at this point, the taproot wants to move once more, but it is blocked by a regular unit uh, that could be friendly or not friendly, and in either case, they are not able to go their full movement. Next up, they can do their explore phase. They'll start by taking a look at this landmark here, and they've decided they do not want to reveal that. Now they're going to take a look at this one, and that one is a bounty hunter, and they have decided to reveal it. Now it gives 3 source when defeated, it has 4 health, and it has the talent Fair Fight. Now you'll notice it does not have an attack stat, and Fair Fight means the bounty hunter will do damage equal to the amount of damage that its target would do. Moving on, the Grove Tenders can now attack. Now they're going to start with Daiwen here, and that has a range of 2, so it is going to do 1 damage over to the bounty hunter. So that means 1 damage is gone, and it cannot retaliate because it is not in range. After that, they are going to have this Warbriar attack, 
we can see that is going to do one damage. And then since the Bounty Hunter took one damage, Fair Fight means it will do one damage back to this Warbriar. Now you may have noticed this Warbriar has an Impale talent, and the way that works is whenever the Warbriar finishes out its movement, it will then do 1 damage to all adjacent opposing minions that it was not already adjacent to at the start of its movement. Now obviously there were none for the Impale to attack when it moved, because at that point they had not explored this Bounty Hunter. Now at this point they're going to have their Taproot attack, it is going to do 1 damage to the Bounty Hunter, so it has 1 health left, and then the Bounty Hunter will do 1 damage back to the Taproot. Now you may have noticed the taproot has a range of 2, and it has the talent called Summon. Now I won't explain Summon just yet, but it's going to come up soon. Alright, it's now our turn, and I just realized that when we deployed Osh, we forgot to give them this piece of equipment. Now every hero can have one piece of equipment, and obviously I did intend to do this, so I'm just going to fix that real quick by putting this underneath. And at this point on our turn, we do want to activate the Reap ability from our mini Harvester. Now the way Reap works is once per round, whenever this hero is adjacent to a source well, we can roll this d6 and take an amount of source equal to the result. So let's see what we get, and it's 2. Well, that certainly could have been better, but hey, taking 2 more source is still a good thing. Okay, let's now do our start of turn actions, and I think we want to do a limited build. As you can see, we have 6 source available, so let's take one of these uh, tokens, we can put that right over here, and now I think let's build a dispatch platform. Now as you can see right over here, it comes into play with a single damage uh, upgrade and a single range upgrade. Now this means it has a range of 2, now down here it has a splash attack, which means you can optionally, when you attack, do 1 damage to all adjacent units, whether they are friendly or not. So let's spend our 4 source, which brings us down to 2. And then we can put the appropriate number of upgrade tokens down underneath it. Now, units are able to attack spires, and every time they take one or more damage, they simply have the bottom upgrade removed. So that means the order in which we put these down here is important. Uh, so I think let's do this so that our uh, dispatch platform will continue to do damage, even though once it takes at least one damage, it will lose some of its range. Now it's worth noting, if we're able to get a fortification, then the, our opponent needs to do at least 2 damage to remove this from there. Now we can put this right over here, and that has certainly increased the amount of damage we can do if our opponent gets close to our gates. Alright, it's time to move, so Dispatch is going to move twice because it was closest to the enemy fortress. After that, Battleborn will move twice, and then we can move Osh up to 2 times if we want. Well, I don't see any reason not to, so let's go 1, 2... And now we could explore if we wanted to, but we already know what this is and we still don't want to reveal it. This means we can go into the attack phase, but currently there is nothing that any of our units can attack, so that means our turn is over. This means the Grove Tenders can go, and they do not have any start of turn actions, so they're going to go into movement. So their Warbriar will move two spaces towards our fortress, and then the Taproot will also move two. And then Dywin will move two spaces right over here. Now again, the hero Daiwen could go into a different direction, they don't have to head towards the fortress, but they've decided that makes sense to them. Now at this point they could explore, but it looks like there's nothing to explore, so it's now time to attack. Now they're going to begin with Daiwen, who has a range of 2, so that means they can easily do 1 damage over to this bounty hunter, which is going to kill it, and that means the Grove Tenders just got 3 more source. It appears they were at 2, so now they're going to go back up to 5. Next up, since Daiwen defeated a unit, they can upgrade. They have an upgrade capacity of 1, and they don't currently have any upgrades, so they're going to take an attack upgrade, which means they now do more damage. Next up, we can see that neither of their other minions can attack, so that means their turn is done. So it's now back to us. Now we don't have any start of turn effects, so let's go right into movement, and let's begin with Dispatch going 1-2. After that, our Battleborn will move twice, and then we can move Osh up to two times as well. In this case, I figure we may as well. They already have an attack upgrade, so let's try to get them closer to the enemy minions that are coming down. Next up, we can explore, but I'm a little bit worried that this might be an engage type of enemy, which means it would have to reveal and we would have to attack it, which would weaken us for the oncoming opposing units. So let's not reveal this, and then we can go into attack. Now, unfortunately, our dispatch has a range of 2, and our opposing unit is 3 spaces of away. This means it looks like none of our units have any good attack targets, so now our opponent can go. Well, to start things off, they could build a Spire now, but they've decided not to do that, so they are now going to go into the move step, and this Warbriar is going to move twice. 
Now the Impale action is going to activate, which does one damage to every opposing uh, unit that it was not adjacent to before. So this means Dispatch is going to take one damage, which means it only has one health left. Now at this point, it looks like the opponent can keep moving, and instead of moving Taproot, they have decided to summon. Now the way this works is this Taproot can summon a Warbriar, a Vine Herald, or a Treed. However, when they are summoned, these come out on their promoted side. Now this is the only way that the Grove Tender is able to promote their regular units, but I haven't actually talked about promoting our regular units just yet, and I will soon. Now in this case, they could spend 3 source to uh, summon this Warbriar, 4 source for the Vine Herald, and 5 source for the Treed. Now after considering their options, they're going to go with the Warbriar, which is going to cost them 3 source. And then this Warbriar is going to be summoned out onto the field. Now the way this works is they actually promote the Taproot, which actually makes them worse. You'll notice all of the attributes went down and they no longer have the summon ability. Next up, they are going to group that underneath the summoned unit. So essentially the Taproot is, I guess, controlling that unit. And once this unit dies, the Taproot will still be there. After that, we can see the upgraded Warbriar has 4 health. So that means we have to put 4 health right down over here. And that is a very formidable deployment. Now this did cost the Taproot's movement. So at this point, it's time for them to move Diwen here. And unfortunately, they are a bit blocked. Uh, they can move on forest, path, and plains, and they cannot move through their own units, so it looks like there is nowhere for them to go. So the Grove Tenders can now attack, and this Warbriar will do one damage to Dispatch. Now unfortunately, that is going to kill off the Dispatch, so we really did not get that much benefit out of Dispatch this round. Now before we move on, unfortunately, the Grove Tenders are going to get 3 source as a reward for destroying this Dispatch character. So we can come back over to our barracks, and the dispatch will go right back over here. Now it's worth noting, if any of your heroes ever die, they're actually permanently removed from the game, but these other units always come back to the barracks where you can deploy them again in the future. Alright, things are looking not too great for us overall, and the Grove Tender's turn is done. So that means we can now go, and before we take our turn, I think let's talk about how we can upgrade our own units. Now for the Brawnen, this is all about fortress upgrades. As you can see in the Honor Pit, it costs 4 source for each upgrade, and the first one would let our Battleborn minions be promoted, and if we look at the other side, they go from having 3 health, 1 damage, and 2 uh, range, to 3 health, 2 damage, and 3 movement. The second time we upgrade the Honor Pit, we can then put our Dispatch minions out as a deployed unit. We can see that they get a Splash attack in that case. As we can see when we look over here, once we get to the second upgrade on assembly, that will have all of our architects be promoted for the rest of the game. The first level of the honor pit will promote our battleborn, the second level will promote our dispatch units, and the third level will promote our forsaken units. Next up, our Aegeus units will be upgraded when we get to the first level of assembly, and our source siege units will become upgraded once we get to the second level of the smelter. Now it's worth noting the first level of the smelter also unlocks the other two types of spires that we can build, so obviously there are a lot of things that we want to upgrade into. Well, we're not going to do any start of turn actions, so now our Battleborn can move, and it will go once right over here, and after that it looks like Osh is going to move up to two times, and I figure we'll go just once onto this spot. Next up, the Battleborn will do one damage to this Warbriar, and then it will retaliate once back, doing one damage to the Battleborn. Next up, Osh could attack, but unfortunately they do not have range on this Warbriar, so we are now done with our turn. Which means the Grove Tenders can go, and they have no start of turn actions. So they're going to begin with movement. This Warbriar cannot move closer to the Fortress, so it's going to stay there, and Impale will not activate, because they were already adjacent to the Battleborn. After that, this Warbriar will move two spaces forward, and then Diwen will also move two spaces. Next up, this Warbriar is going to do one damage to our Battleborn, which unfortunately will kill it. The next thing they do is take two more source as a reward for defeating our Battleborn. At this point, the Grove Tenders could attack with their other two units, but it does not look like they have any valid targets. Now, they could have explored this earlier in their turn, but it looks like they decided not to. This means it's now time for our turn, and I think we can skip right to movement. Now, one thing we could do is move right over here and then attack and destroy this Warbriar. Now that seems pretty good, however, if we move to this spot, then we know that on the next turn, our opponent will move this Warbriar over here, that will impale us for 1, which will do 1 damage, and then it will attack us for 2, which will actually kill off our hero. Now that does not sound like a great plan to me, so I think instead what we should do on this turn is move our hero back 1 space. 
Now after that, we have no valid attack targets, so we can just move on, and of course we are not going to explore. So that is effectively going to finish out our turn, which means our opponent can now go again. Now they are going to go right into movement, and you'll notice now that when they move their Warbriar, it's going to go 1, 2, and this one is going to impale us once. Now that's fine, because we still have 2 health left, and then of course their other units are going to move. Now this Warbriar is going to move twice, and then they also have Diewin over here. And with them, they're going to move to this spot here. After their movement, they have decided to explore, and they're going to take a look at this token. And then they've decided to put this back without revealing it. Now at this point, they can now attack, and their Warbriar is going to do one damage to Osh. Now this is part of our plan, that's going to lose us one of our health, but we still have one health remaining. And now Osh is going to retaliate. So Osh does one plus another damage for that upgrade token, so that is two damage back, so that means this has defeated the Warbriar when it's not actually our turn. So that means this will be removed from the map, and we will get one source as a bonus. So we're going to go up to three source total, and then Osh is going to level up again. Now they already have one of these upgrades, and that is their maximum. So that means instead of gaining another upgrade, they are going to flip over to their promoted side. Now when this happens, they do lose this upgrade, but you'll notice that the promoted side already does 2 damage. Now over here, it looks like Osh has gained a new talent, which is called Survival. Now with the Survival trait, if we don't move Osh and don't attack with them on a turn, they can actually heal back one of their health. Next up, the Grove Tender can attack with both of their other units, but it looks like they don't have anything in range, and that's going to finish out their turn. This means it's now time for us to go, and as you can see, we can be more proactive considering we baited the Grove Tender into having that Warbriar be killed on their turn. So now it's our turn to go, but before we actually move, I think let's use our other limited building action. So let's add a peg down here, and now we can see that we have three source. So with this building action, I think let's upgrade our dispatch platform. Now we're going to add a range upgrade to it, and that is the third upgrade, so that's going to cost us three source. This means we go down to zero source overall. And now we know that our dispatch platform can hit all the way up to here. And next turn, this Warbriar will move onto that location. So that means we can start shooting at it from a great distance. Next up, it's time for movement. And I think what we need to do is run away a bit with Osh. Now, Osh is obviously quite powerful, but also only has one health remaining. So let's have them move two spaces right over here, and hopefully this dispatch platform can soften up the Warbriar a bunch, and then we can swing in and defeat it with Osh later on. Next up we can attack, but we'd have no valid targets, and the survival ability does not go into play because of course Osh did move on this turn. So this means we are now done, and the Grove Tenders can go. And they've decided to go right to movement. Now this Warbriar is closer to our fortress, so it's going to move two spaces. After that, they can move their hero over here, and they know that this Warbriar is now in range of this dispatch platform, which has the Splash ability. Now Splash does one damage to all units that are adjacent to the targeted unit, so they are incentivized not to put Diewin next to this Warbriar. Now with that in mind, they're going to go a little slower and move Diewin right over here. And now that they are done with our movement, it's time for the first Spire activation of the game. Now this always happens after movement and before exploring, and this dispatch platform does indeed have the Warbriar in range, because again, it has a natural range of 1, plus 2 more for the upgrades underneath it. So that means it can target all the way over here, and when Spires attack, they do it a little differently than units. Now the way this works is the Spire is going to take one of these attack dice for every one of its overall attack. Now it's going to roll all of these dice, and we can see that our dispatch platform currently has just one attack. Now these dice have four one damage sides, they have a single blank, and they have a two. So it's possible this could go very poorly or very well for us. So let's roll the die and see what we get, and that went really well for us, we got a two. Now that's just a one in six chance of happening, and that means we have done two damage to this Warbriar. Now it unfortunately had four health overall, but that was still a very successful Spire attack. Now that we are done with the Spire phase, it looks like the Grove Tender can do an exploration. And they are curious to see what this is, they know that we saw it earlier on and did not reveal it. And after looking at it, they are definitely going to reveal it. Uh, they like the idea of potentially being able to rift walk right over to our gate. Now, of course, this is not going to have an effect until another one of the rift walk uh, locations is revealed out on the map.
Well, now that they are done with exploration, they can go into attacking, but it does not look like they have any legal targets with either of their units. So that's going to finish out their turn, and that means we can now go, and I think let's jump right into movement. Now we know that Osh can do 2 damage, and this Warbriar currently only has 2 health. This means we can move 2 spaces forward and then kill the Warbriar, but we know that there is a taproot underneath. Now we also know that Diwin is right over there, and each one of those could do 1 damage, so that would not put us in a pretty good situation, and I really don't want Osh to die because of course uh, once your heroes go away you cannot get them back. So instead I think let's keep playing defensively and just move right over here. After that, we have nothing to attack, so the Grove Tender can go, and they're going to go right into movement. Now, they're going to start with the Warbriar, and that's going to move two spaces forward. And fortunately, this Impale ability only affects units. It does not affect the Fortresses or the Spires. Now, after that, they can move Diwin up here. And if they wanted to, they could head over to here. That would put them in range of our dispatch platform, though, and Diwin only has two health. Now, if we wanted to, we could choose to target them instead of the Warbriar with our dispatch platform, and we'd have a 1 in 6 chance to kill off Diwin, and they feel like those odds are not going to be good enough for them. So instead, they're going to move two spaces over here, and now it's time for the next Spire activation. So our Dispatch Platform can target this Warbriar right here. It of course does one die roll worth of damage, and unfortunately, we did not get anything with that roll. So we got really lucky with the first roll, and got the other unlucky side with this second one. This means the Grove Tenders can now explore, so Diwin is going to check out this landmark here. Oops, it looks like they hit an Engage Beast. That's not necessarily what they were looking for, and this is a Traxar Hellion. Now that comes in with 6 health, it does 1 damage, and you can see as a benefit, once this is killed, the player who kills it gets the ability to immediately build a free spire on the location where it was. So this is going to head right over here, and they can of course put 6 health underneath it. Next up, the Grove Tenders can now attack, and they're going to start with the Warbriar. Now this has a 2 damage attack, and it is going to hit our dispatch platform. Now, as I mentioned before, whenever Spires are targeted, if they take one or more damage, they will lose their bottom upgrade. Now, fortunately, this is uh, two damage, and the extra damage does not do anything extra. So uh, we're just going to lose one upgrade in this case. And of course, if we had a fortification, that would only be removed if we took two damage, which of course we did in this case. Now, that is a bit of a bummer considering we spent three source to put this down, but I think it was still worth it to us. Next up, Diwin can attack, and whenever any unit has the ability to attack a landmark unit, it must do so. So they don't have a choice here, they have to do 1 damage to this Traxar Hellion, and it will then retaliate doing 1 damage to Diwin, which they certainly don't like because they only have 1 health left at this point. Well, they've now finished out their attacks, which means their turn is done, and that means we can go. Now let's go right into movement, and I think it's now time to strike. So Osh can go one space forward right here, and then after that we have no exploration to do, so we can now go into attacking. Now Osh currently does two damage, and this Warbriar has two health, so that is going to be enough to kill the Warbriar. That means we are going to immediately get one source as a benefit, which means we now have one source. Next up, since Osh was able to once again kill a minion, they will upgrade. Now they are on the promoted side, and they still only have one capacity for upgrades. And I think considering they currently only have one health, let's put a fortification upgrade underneath. Now once they take a damage, this will go away, and when they level up again, we could change this up and maybe put another attack upgrade on there. But for now, I think we should make him more hardy. After this, we can see over here that a taproot minion has now been revealed. Now, whenever grouped minions are revealed, they immediately get health equal to their current health stat. So in this case, they will get one health, and then they'll go back to the same location. Okay, that has finished out our attack, which means our turn is done. This means the Grove Tender player can go, and they're going to go right into movement. Now, we can see that this taproot cannot actually move because we are blocking the way, so it's going to stay there. And then the Grove Tender is going to move Diwin one space back to that spot here. Next up, it's time for the Spire activation, and this Dispatch Platform's range is now 2. That means it can hit anything in this area, and this Taproot is definitely within that area. So let's roll one of these, and we are going to hope not to miss, and we got a 2. Well, we didn't necessarily need that 2 in this case. That is going to certainly be enough to kill off this Taproot. So that means as a reward, we will get 2 more Source. So we're going to go up to 3 total. 
and then we can look out to the board and see that there are currently no minions left in play. There are, of course, a couple of heroes, but as soon as the game state has zero minions out, then the assault phase will immediately end. So that means the uh, Grove Tender will not even have the ability to attack with Diewin this turn. This means we can now move into the second wave of the game, and we can start at the beginning with the event phase. Now, this did not happen in the first wave of the game, but it does happen now. The first thing that happens is the first player designation moves, so this means the Grove Tender is going to start things off within this overall wave, and now if we had any ongoing events, we would discard them, and after that, we draw the top event card and read it out. So let's take a look and see what we have. Now, this is called Restlessness. It happens during the Onslaught phase, and it says that all landmark minions gain the talent Engage for this wave. Now again, engage means that they must be flipped over, you cannot put them back, and uh, players obviously have to fight those landmark minions, so it appears things are a little bit riskier in the next onslaught phase, at least as far as revealing landmarks is concerned. This means it's now time for the income phase of this wave, but I think I'm going to save that one for the extended playthrough. At this point, the tutorial is coming to a close because I've taught you most of the standard rules to the game. Obviously, there are a lot of other rules that are specific to the different factions that we haven't covered just yet, and we will, of course, uh, explain all of those as we bump into them as we play through the rest of the game. So, at this point, you can watch that extended playthrough by clicking a link for it down below in the description, or by clicking the I up there in the top corner, and I hope you've enjoyed learning how to play Cloud Spire. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you can do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.